Welcome to the HC Insider Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the commodities sector and the people within it. I'm your host, Paul Chapman. Today in somewhat of an extended episode, our guest Paul Horsmall, Global Head of Commodities Research at Standard Chartered, joins us to look back on the energy markets in particular, but commodities more broadly, in 2022, and a look forward to 2023. It was an incredibly eventful year. Many of the major topics covered in the 52 episodes that we did of the HC Insider podcast. I referenced some of the guests and topics in this episode. But I do want to take the opportunity to extend a very special thanks to all of you listeners and to all of our guests who made the One A Week podcast possible. I also want to extend my thanks to my colleagues at HC Group, all 60 of us spread around the world, for generously providing ideas and connections for guests and topics for the podcast. In fact, 2023 is a bit of a watershed moment for the company. 2023 is our 20th year anniversary. The firm was founded 20 years ago by Justin Pearson and Nick Watt, and I joined a year later along with my colleague Damien Stewart, with whom I now co-head the business. We've certainly grown from those early starts just focused in energy, and we're now spread around the world in our offices in Sao Paulo, Houston, New York, London, Geneva, Singapore, and Abu Dhabi, servicing our clients' search needs, as well as talent advisory, all focused in the commodities sector. Available for download from our website will also be our annual review, a look back on the talent trends and themes from 2022 and some predictions for 2023. It's been a tremendous year of growth for the podcast and I'm excited for 2023. That being said, it really does support the show if you can take the time to leave us a review or just five stars on the platform you're listening on. That really does help promote the show and enable us to continue to get the level of guest that I know you all expect. So there's nothing more to say, except as always, enjoy the episode. Paul, welcome to the show. My pleasure. So what we're doing essentially is a bit of a wrap up of, of 2022 from an energy perspective and then a look forward to 2023. And I should say that this is going to be going out on Jan 4th, so possibly the worst day of the year for everyone as they crawl back into their their commutes and so forth. But, you know, we're recording this in in December. So barring any unforeseen major events, (laughs) if there are, please, please excuse us. So so I want to start off, and I mean, it has been an absolutely, at least in, in my career, one of the most notable years in the commodities world. You just have to look the number of times commodity-related issues, energy-related issues have hit the front pages of the major newspapers, the major news sites. And, and the population is now very well aware of challenges around supply chain, rises in, in various commodity prices and that the impact. And then, of course, the very acute issues that we're facing in in Europe. Can you just give us a, you know, the, what were, you know, can you just talk 2022 and before we dig into sort of the trends behind and the themes and the learning, you know, what in your mind are kind of the, the major events of 2022 that we should signal here? Yes, I, I think it's hard to get away from um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine as being the, the, the watershed event, uh, the defining issue of the year and all the knock on effects it's had, not just in terms of, um, uh, unbalancing uh, energy markets, but also in terms of changing government's agendas um, and attitudes towards energy and energy policy. So bringing energy security back into the fore is a concern when it's really been absent for the last 25, 30 years, feeding into that, uh, if you like, that policy trilemma of how do we now balance between issues of energy security and sustainability, while also wanting to keep economy strong and moving forward. So I, again, just feels like that's the event which is uh, going to set the energy agenda for, for really the next decade. Yeah. And as you say, there was lots of underlying trends, but this seems to have been the, the one, obviously, I mean, such a, the, uh, an event of such magnitude has exposed all of those weaknesses and has stressed all of those already quite a stressed energy market. Have you seen 
that shift from kind of the expectation that you know the world is globalizing and you can get energy just in time and it's no longer really relevant to your economy because prices are going to be low no one's really going to seriously imperil that and you know there are analogies with europe in the summer of 1914 if you go back and look at bond prices and the work of neil ferguson on this how real do you think that shift and recognition at the political level of energy security i mean have you seen a real seismic shift towards that and one that you're confident will remain yes I and mean, it it's it, it's happened um, r- remarkably quickly but i think it it was an added layer put onto a debate that about energy that was already happening remember in in europe gas prices um, were already extremely high before the invasion they've been rising right the way through the back end of uh, next year what the invasion added in was that added if you like weaponization uh, of energy flows by russia the realization by consuming governments that their vulnerability wasn't just to higher prices or on a global market but also to a a supplier who might weaponize or try to uh, exert some kind of uh, political leverage uh, through energy flows so i think that's the new bit and uh, if you run through almost country by country the speed of transformation in in germany has uh, i think has been dramatic over the course of the, the last 10 months and germany which had really had a, originated this central importance uh, first with the soviet union then with russia trying to link in with um, uh, energy flows seeing that as a large part of their like rail politique first with the soviet union and then their continuing dialogue with russia the reversal of that policy has been abrupt and and um, i think uh, definitive it, it won't go back to the extent now that um, you know even if there were a change of policy the war finished um, even if the uh, nord stream was uh, available i i really don't think there's much appetite uh, through a lot of europe to to resume those energy flows certainly not in germany certainly not in poland and that does feel like a, a definitive break mm. And it's actually amazing how effective, essentially, LNG has been at filling that gap, right? I mean, some 70% of that gas has already been replaced at last look from LNG. And you've got Germany, Poland and others building a heck of a lot of terminals that are scheduled to come online in, in the next year. Yes, yeah, so I mean, there's the, the numbers and the balances sort of have some good news like that, but also some perhaps less good news. I mean, the biggest real um, item in making sure that uh, inventories have been able to build actually a little bit faster than normal during the injection season this year really has been suppression of demand. So demand has been down probably year to date, uh, close to 14 percent. In some months that uh, demand loss has been more than 20 percent. It seems to have accelerated through to the back end of the year. So while that's kept the balances there, at, at some point, we'd rather like to get those bits of the economy moving again. And so doing that without prices getting too far out of hand and also being able to maintain the normal uh, inventory dynamics, now that may be a little bit more of a, of a longer term project. But short term, through the combination of demand, increased LNG flows either directly into the EU or via the UK, the UK has some spare terminal capacity, uh, so therefore was able to compensate for the tightness in terminal capacity in, in Europe, together with other a few changes from Norwegian flows, a little bit here, a little bit there. It's all ended up in a situation where the gas has been covered. And again, going back uh, 10 months ago, I think if um, any analyst had said um, uh, Europe could more or less decouple itself from from russian gas flows uh, before the end of the year i mean we would have thought that was complete madness and that was uh, far too long a project so mm. the speed with it and the speed with which uh, uh, I, I think politics has uh, taken on board the problem and reversed its um, previous course um, really has been uh, quite exceptional and i guess winter has yet to bite so we'll we'll, we'll come back to this when we look at 2023 but staying, so I want to stay with that sort of notion of kind of the shock, the surprise in this, because one of the kind of learnings is if you've taken us back to February, early February, for the most part, most analysts, most markets did not believe that Russia was going to invade. And I just want to get your comments on that, because I just think that's, you know, 
I think it it reminds us all that the world can have serious surprises, even with such events such as this, which have human intent behind them and human knowledge behind them. Yes, I think that's uh, certainly certainly uh, energy analysts. Um, I don't think uh, even as the tension ratcheted up, you know, th- through through December, January, and um, the early part of February, I don't think there was much expectation that. Um, uh, what, what would happen was, was in any way a realistic prospect. I think with the sort of the hindsight, when you look at some of the regional analysts, some of those on the political side, I mean, there were voices out there who were pretty convinced that this was going to happen at some time somewhere. So the question was where and Ukraine was more than likely going to be the, the, the next step uh, following the invasion of um, Crimea in 2014. So that there were voices out there, and it's perhaps an interesting one for for the analyst community. That you know, why didn't we have that um, sort of information in there? Why were we so quick to just assume that this couldn't happen when there did appear to be uh, you know, people who knew um, Putin well, who knew um, Russia well, who were did think that this was a quite serious possibility? Well, you, you had the step. White House and you know the SIS pointing firmly that this invasion was really oh, yeah. going to happen right it's more it's, it's fascinating sort of perhaps a indication of a lack of trust in in government institutions you know in the wake of some of the events of the last couple of years so the information as you say was out there i guess taking it some sort of region by region so then we look at russia and you kind of there was the, the globe or at least the west did absolutely mobilize in the form of sanctions trying ultimately to, to shut off Russia's main source of, well, cut Russia off from the, from the Western economy. There was kind of a back and forth on oil, on how that would play in it, which is obviously the major source of Russian revenues and perhaps the reason why we haven't seen an economic collapse that we would have expected. The oil basically continued to flow. Can you just remind us all of kind of where oil and gas stood within those sanctions and then kind of what's happened to Russia since, where, where that oil's been going instead? Yes, yeah, so obviously the oil and gas have taken uh, different paths. So on the gas side, um, it's been more to do with that um, uh, Russian weaponization of flows and the gradual Russian reduction uh, in flows. Remember, Nord Stream flows were never, were never particularly sanctioned. What happened was that uh, Russia gradually reduced the flow from 100% of capacity to 60% and then to 40% and then to 20% and then eventually through to zero. So the reduction in um, in Russian gas flows it was very much down to direct Russian policy, the belief being that um, if you strangled through supply, that should create um, enough division within the European allies that perhaps some of the support uh, for Ukraine might um, start to, um, uh, to, to, to wither away. It didn't happen, but it was very much um, a, a direct... Um, Russian policy to to reduce flows to the extent uh, now that as you said well over eighty percent of um, the gas is gone. What's left is um, a few flows uh, by Ukraine, a few flows um, by uh, Turkey uh, through Turk Stream and um, uh, in, in through in through the Balkans. So there are a few countries uh, left with some dependence, but uh, Germany and Poland no, no Russian flows at all now. Oil a bit different. That um, has been uh, direct uh, sanctions and embargo. It's come in uh, various stages. Um, the US um, enforced its embargo almost immediately. The UK brought in an embargo with a uh, an end of 2022 deadline, but in effect stopped um, pretty much importing all flows uh, uh, immediately. And then the EU discussion has come through to this. Um, so sort of two steps, main steps in uh, cutting the flows further. The crude uh, sa- sanctions, which kicking on fifth or did kick in on fifth uh, of December, and then uh, moving into February, the uh, constraints on uh, Russian products and particularly diesel. So it's it's coming in in two stages. There are some countries which will have exceptions to that. Those uh, reliant on pipeline flows um, who find it difficult to source um, oil elsewhere. So particularly the the, the Hungarians, uh, a couple of other countries as well. But overall, for Northern Europe, flows oil have more or less um, stopped. If anything, 
the initial response in, in the Mediterranean was that flows are actually increased, but again, they, they will stop as the, uh, the sanctions come through. So the same sort of net effect is that Russian energy is removed or greatly reduced in the European market for both gas and oil, but slightly different mechanics. For gas, that was Russia's choice. Uh, for oil, it's been um, very much the um, direct uh, sanctions by the EU. I think if perhaps at the start of the crisis, the EU was more worried about um, uh, sanctioning gas than uh, than sanctioning oil, so perhaps its uh, major vulnerability was more on the gas side. It's where it's going to be hardest to substitute. But um, that decision has, in effect, been taken away from Europe. Uh, that was that was Russian policy, and as a policy, I, I think we have to say it has failed. In that, I think it did have that political benefits uh, for Russia, and it's reduced the revenues from from European gas really quite dramatically. It is, in, it is interesting that actually is sort of this, you know, a bit of an own goal there really by the Russians in, in, in self-sanctioning the other way around. And, you know, again, it's kind of like the, the whole rule of sanctions, right? Is it the unintended consequences are that alternative trade flows set up, the, the gas will flow. And uh, it's providing a credible opportunity for North American exporters and LNG exporters in general. Staying on the oil, though, because the gas, I mean, where, well, I guess first off, though, where, where is that gas going? Where is Russia now selling that gas, or is it just stranded? Yes, it effectively is. The gas system was um, uh, from, from Western Siberia, those pipelines, very hard to divert them uh, off anywhere else. You might be able to get to divert a little bit um, uh, into LNG facilities, but it, the system really wasn't set up for that. So the, the, the gas into Europe is, is, very, is very much stranded. Mm. Do we have any sense, by the way, you know, there are obviously the conspiracy theories out there. Do we have any sense what happened with Nord Stream 2, sort of the qui bono on, on that one? I, I, I think that's one that may run and run, but um, you know the, the particularly bizarre thing about that is that ultimately I don't think it makes any made any difference. The chances of um, uh, of any gas ever flowing through either Nord Stream or Nord Stream Two again were effectively zero. So it certainly would have been a a, a much bigger story had gas still been. Um, flowing through Nord Stream, but with Nord Stream at zero and not expected to come back, you know, it was, um, you know, perhaps the sort of, um, you know, the coup de grace to say, hey, look, this is definitely not coming back, but politically and economically, it, it wasn't coming back um, uh, anyway. So it is a little odd, but no, I, I don't think we have the definitive um, uh, story on precisely um, uh, what happened there, but it was hitting a target which um, really was pretty much useless at that point. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've had, heard a few economists this year talk about sort of this will be the year we start talking about the world splitting into blocks, particularly a, a China block and an, a, a Western block, a US-led block, from a global trade standpoint. Does this really firmly put Russia from an energy standpoint in China's camp now? You know, has Russia sort of lost some of its power by effectively removing half of its global sales, if you'd like? Well, it certainly means that Russia has to recalibrate its um, its oil trade, work out precisely which markets um, it can put at least some of those displaced volumes in. China actually hasn't increased its, at least on official figures, hasn't really increased its um, imports of Russian crude very much since the invasion, in fact, hardly at all. Where the extra volumes have gone in are primarily India, very large increase in um, uh, flows of Russian oil in, into India and also into Turkey. So those are the sort of the two major areas where it, it's been easy to put those extra volumes in. So maybe not necessarily forcing Russia into a China ambit, but um, certainly making it far more dependent on flows into, um, into Asia than before. Yeah. So so let's turn to the price of oil and it has been a phenomenal year for on the on the whole for crude traders in particular I mean some of the numbers are astonishing that we're hearing at HC group and in fact 
I don't think he'd mind me giving him the uh, giving them a shout out. But Kurt Chapman and I shared a coffee uh, a week or so ago and congratulated ourselves on the prescience of our episode back in June 2021, talking about crude oil being the hottest seat in in energy transition. And there's more there to be proved out. But the year, I guess my question to you is the year has been characterized by a lot of volatility. Great for traders. This community knows that. But it has, we haven't seen, you know, we started the year with, with some phenomenal expectations around the price of energy, the price of commodities in general, the much vaunted super cycle. Can I, we'd lo- I'd love to get your take on kind of why that stalled and what's going on there. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting can you said take the comparison back to the start of the year and what when the market wasn't expecting the invasion of Ukraine. I think you're right at that point there was a fairly widespread view that uh, prices would be moving up to the upside that um, they would be clearing $100 on a fairly sustained basis. A lot of views that the annual average would uh, come in uh, uh, over $100. And I think we, from where we are now, look back on, on those expectations and say, well, hang on, it didn't happen. And it didn't happen even with the benefit of, um, uh, from an a oil price point of view, of the knock-on effects of the, the invasion of Ukraine, which obviously clearly should have, um, uh, if we added that to those um, consensus views at the start of the year, that should have set prices um, right into the stratosphere. By, by mid-year, it's, it's not that long since um, analysts were talking of prices going to you know, above $300 a barrel because of um, the impact of Ukraine on top of this extremely bullish scenario. So you know, looking back, you say, okay, well, why didn't that work? Uh, prices uh, haven't averaged uh, $100. They've moved above $100 for um, significant periods of time, but not there for the um, for the longest period. And I, I think the biggest um, uh, reason why it didn't happen was just that uh, demand is um, much more sensitive to, to, to price and demand is sensitive to a weakening in the economy. And it's demand that was really been... Um, uh, misjudged most this year. Uh, oddly enough, I was actually just in a meeting with, with Kurt, uh, coincidentally, and we were looking back on the same meeting one year ago. And in that meeting, you know, there were people, I think everybody was looking at strong demand growth. Some were talking of demand growth above 5 million barrels a day. So that's what's gone wrong. Demand has disappointed. It's less than 2 million barrels a day, probably more like one and a half. Part of that is to do with China and China not um, uh, coming out of its COVID restrictions, but it's not all China. It's also disappointments on, uh, on, on OECD demand, the weakening of economies, the price sensitivity that has brought um, US demand for diesel and gasoline and made them extremely weak this year. So I think that was what went wrong with that um, theory most of all was just getting the demand forecasts and over uh, estimating the potential for demand after coronavirus to, to to really stretch the supply side. We, we never really tested the theory that um, there wasn't enough supply side capacity, you know, because there, there was throughout the year. But I, I think that was also a weak scenario, you know, the belief that there wasn't enough spare capacity to cope with extreme stresses coming through from strong demand but that wasn't um, re- really the major point of uh, of stress it, it was that demand side which has fallen away so much um, faster i think than was imagined yeah the the year was certainly characterized by volatility i remember being at the the ft commodity conference in i guess late march um, i think it was in lausanne and there were a number of very large well large trading houses, CFOs, very concerned about liquidity and about their access to cash, given the the, the run up in prices and the volatility associated with it. What was, what's was what been, generally speaking, driving all that volatility across energy, products, you know, gas, etc.? Yes, yeah, so I think it's, it's a function of, of various things. And I see that the volatility... Uh, did fall away and has sort of normalized um, more towards the back end of the year, at least on on the oil side. I think at the height of the volatility, it was that sort of combination of, you know, genuine 
uncertainty in the market, um, you know, reasons why volatility should be um, particularly large. It was partly to do with positioning, talking about sort of dominant um, consensus views and super cycles. And it meant that a lot of traders were all facing the same way. So that's uh, you know all working on the same sort of trading hypothesis, which meant that they'd all um, you know t t tend to find themselves um, on the same side of the trade if something uh, changed. So that kind of outsized uh, movement, um, I, I think, partly came with that. It was a lack of diversity of views, a lack, um, and I would say, actually, of good analysis uh, lurking around. So it's partly that. It was partly due to the composition of the players themselves. We have had this um, sort of shaking out of the trading community itself, not so much in the way of um, specialist uh, commodity players. Um, I mean, the traders are there, but not the hedge funds much more importance for the kind of top-down um, macro funds. So they're really expressing uh, an FX or a, a rates or an overall Fed view through commodities rather than doing it uh, sort of bottom-up and expressing a commodities view out of uh, pure commodities fundamentals. So I think for all of those reasons, uh, you ended up with... Um, you know, markets which would tend to have outsized moves, I mean, partly because they should have been outside moves and partly because of what people were thinking, how they were positioned and the sort of traders we had. So all, I think, structural changes um, overall within the market in, in there as well affected all that. But again, we go back to Russia invading Ukraine. That um, you know, w w was enough to mean that margins needed to go up. It meant that um, a lot of people were caught in positions where uh, they would need to liquidate positions just to meet the margin calls on uh, on holding uh, other core positions. So if we were being a bit apocalyptic about it, to some extent it was that sort of phasing out of markets where money is cheap and uh, margins are low. It's now moving into a market with the rate cycle where you know, money isn't as cheap and uh, margins um, are, are reflecting the, uh, the the overall uncertainty really across markets. Mm. And, I, and I want to come back to money supply very shortly. I just want to sort of, you know, I guess one of our most popular episodes of the year Somewhat surprisingly, I guess, given it sort of it sounds a very targeted episode, was the um, episode ninety seven, the financialization of oil markets and the the madness of crowds with Greg Newman, and in that he really, I guess, elucidates on you know how the impact of algorithmic trading and of actually a much more granularity in those in the in the finance in the contracts available. And that actually a lot of the, the markets in some senses have become a more perfect reflection of reality as a result in some ways. So that has had an impact on how crude oil has traded this year, and presumably a trend that's going to continue. You mentioned there the funds. Obviously, this year, at least from sort of the, the broader commodities perspective, has been a year when there'd been many high profile moves to these macro funds. You know, many hedge funds are looking to build out a commodity offering. It's definitely good for the, the assets under management, if not performance. Dare I say, what you know? What's your take there? It, it, you know, you know, did they have good years? How big of an impact did they play on sort of swinging those markets? Yes, I mean, well, I, mean, I should stress first that um, you know we are talking here purely about drivers of the vol volatility. I mean, I don't think the average price of oil would have been a a any different one way or the other. It, it is um, sort of within those uh, trading swings, but. I think you're exactly right. There is um, uh, some kind of reverse move. There are more commodity specialists coming back in, into macro funds, but they will be looking at uh, commodities a little bit more bottom up. But it's a move that's happening after you know, almost a decade of moving the other way and moving the other way. Uh, really quite fast, particularly in, in the last five years. So hopefully that would sort of rebalance a little bit of um, these problems of um, group thinking, the more or less all trading on exactly the same hypothesis should bring in a little bit more diversity of views and perhaps also more diversity in, in ways of, um, of playing the market. It's um, you know, much more this has been a very good year for playing the market through uh, through options. 
and call spreads have been a much better way of uh, trading than um, uh, doing anything in, in terms of outright price. And so that sort of level of, I think, option sophistication and really trading the entire volatility surface, not just the um, the headline front months, that's an interesting development. And that, uh, a, a, again, implies that the market might start to uh, regain some of the, the, the areas where it's uh, it's lost in the, the tenure of trades had uh, moved in a lot recently. It was getting harder to do large size, size trades further down the curve. The, the option surface itself also had sort of receded um, to, towards uh, the, uh, the the front of the curve. So hopefully some of that um, uh, those changes will repair some of the problems further down the curve that have arisen over the, the the past year. But big stress: the market was never broken. You know these are these are all factors at the side. But there, while volatility was um, certainly reducing liquidity, I don't think we ever reached a point where liquidity was so poor that you could be worried about the uh, the price itself. You know, it was still generating the right signal. Mm. It perhaps got a bit blown out of hand when some of the more extreme bulls felt that um, lack of liquidity was the reason why their thesis had um, started going wrong why prices started falling from from June and why there wasn't the follow through to the 200. And really, the problem wasn't about markets and market structure and market liquidity. It was because the thesis was wrong. The price was falling because there was a growing surplus, because demand had fallen, because the market itself, um, you know, it wasn't tight. It wasn't a super cycle. And so I think we have to be a little bit careful that um, why there are some issues um, in, in terms of uh, liquidity at various points, there was never an issue where lack of liquidity was causing prices to move in the wrong way. I just want to sort of note something you mentioned there about sort of this, you know, what we definitely have seen this year as a search firm has been, you know, a demand that I haven't seen for like a decade or more of the physical traders wanting to bring back derivative expertise into their into their trading floors. The, the, the lowly role of a crude options trader last last in high demand a decade ago is is suddenly back in vogue for those reasons you pointed out, right? The volatility is driving the need for a different type of trader and the opportunity for that trader. It, yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, that um, can only be a positive development because it's, A, anything that brings in um, people with with skills and different skills has got to be good for the um, development of a market. And so going back on to that problem of everybody constantly looking the the same way and turning around, you'd lose that problem if you've got um, a much more diverse um, set of trading, trading systems and people trading at different points. um, It tends to sort of uh, sort itself out much more easily so that that's a very i think healthy development of bringing back in those skills and uh, allowing um, uh, the option traders back into the fold and they had been as you'd said um, pretty much forced out of the market over in in recent years and it's great that that um, uh, is now again a skill in demand Mm. not that many of them are are left but and that just just to say that though what we haven't seen if you remember the last time we had the returns like this and you know the 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 returns that we're seeing in commodities was let's say let's say 2012 okay or, or you know roughly speaking you had far more participants in the market then because in the last sort of run up you had a lot, all the banks get in, build out physical trading capabilities or you know, commodity trading capabilities. You had lots of startup funds. We, you know, Traffic Euro and VTOL and the likes were relatively tiny organizations back then, in, at least in the mid-2000s. We haven't seen a lot of new entrants. There have been obviously funds come in. There have been CTAs, etc. But you've not seen many new trading startups. And if, if you ask me, I think that's down to obviously the cost of financing you know there are fewer commodity finance banks we've covered this enough and now you've got the cost of capital going up but we haven't actually it's not like we've seen a whole new slew slew of participants if if i'm right yes i i I think that is right and starting to see early signs perhaps of some of the banks that got out of um, commodities trading or scaled back heavily you know just dipping their toe into um to sort of re-engage with the markets. But um, you're right, there hasn't been that great rush of new entrants. 
and, and that's unusual. So I think if we take the history of um, certainly the, the, the Brent market, you know, back to the beginning, there's always been another wave of participants to, to, to come in. It, it started, well, actually with the Vittles and the trading companies, with those who sort of came in to a market created by the major oil companies. The traders were then followed by the um, the Japanese traders, the Circuit Shosha came in, the Wall Street refiners, as was the Wall Street banks moved in. Then the, you've got the, the hedge funds, um, you know, all various types of um, uh, private equity. At every stage, there was another wave of new entrance into the market. And, and you're right, so this time that wave hasn't happened yet. It's been more of a kind of rescaling of of some of the actors that had previously scaled back. But a lot of the reasons why they scaled back, and this applies, I suppose, most of the banks, those reasons haven't really gone away. A lot of that was to do with uh, regulation. It was to do with um, authorities wanting to reduce the amount of proprietary trading generally that banks did. A lot of it was to do with uh, the um, internal accounting of credit. Uh, how much does, does VAR cost I mean, to get enough VAR to be able to trade internally, the way that was accounted, suddenly started making access to VAR considerably more expensive. So those reasons haven't gone away. What's um, brought them back in has been the markets themselves. So that extra volatility, those extra returns, you know, the extra interest in the markets, that's what's brought them in. But uh, yeah. some of those underlying reasons why they disappeared, I, I think, are still um, a very much depressing involvement. Yeah, and I think it's that interest, obviously, that's also driving the hedge funds to want to say they have this capability, as opposed to the likes of, you know, one or two like Citadel. We had Seb Barrick on a panel on the podcast earlier this year, you know, who have been in it for the long run and have built up a formidable, you know, capability and moat around their business. Just one thing. So we're talking a bit about, you know, OK, the crude markets were never broken. And as you say, you know, I think I, if I was if I had lost my I'd blame it on liquidity as well. But that wasn't necessarily I mean, there was a lot of concern in the spring about the natural gas markets in Europe being broken. Right. I mean, that they, they that almost is that a different story Were they almost, you know, a, a knife edge. Yes, yeah, so and obviously the, the amount of stress w was massively greater. So moving from markets which, you know, t TTF, um, Dutch title transfer facility uh, gas. Now, we're used to seeing that uh, trade in the sort of, sort, of, sort of 20 euros a megawatt hour, 30 euros a megawatt hour. It was a real shock, uh, The you know, roughly uh, the end of de December of, of, of last year, uh, December 2021, that... Um, Prices breached through 80, 90, 100. You know, that, that was a real shock. That was already you know, extreme stress. And then as Russia started to peel back um, the, the utilization on, on, on Nord Stream, prices were pushing up beyond 200, 300. You know, realized volatility was at um, you know, completely unprecedented levels. So again, I, I don't think it was necessarily broken, but it was under such massive stress that um, pricing in volatility like that um, uh, would make it very difficult to, you know, to, to, to hold uh, large positions, liquidity would come down. Being positive about the market, the, um, uh, the good thing is that it, you know, it didn't collapse, it still continued to generate prices, it didn't um, need um, large scale regulatory or government uh, in intervention, it, it we, we got a price out every day. Now, whether it was possible for users necessary to get into that market and do all the trades that they wanted, particularly um, those that wished to, to hedge, again, that's another question. But in terms of the way price was being risked, uh, um, risk was being priced, sorry, I, I do think the market performed um, as well as it could. Mm. But again, the problem was the underlying circumstances caused by the invasion of Ukraine, it wasn't really the structure of the market or the nature of its participants. I think it performed as well as it could, given the extreme stress it was under. Yeah. Again, big thing, you know, it did keep on producing prices. There was still a market there. It does still continue to be a market. And the only time I've seen people talk about wanting to perhaps um, mute their um, involvement in TTF was really when the EU started talking about price caps, i.e. so when the government did get involved, that was the point when 
people were worried about getting too much uh, exposure to the front month. People started talking about moving trades uh, more over the counter to avoid that, because uh, even a very, very high price cap that um, perhaps you wouldn't ever get to, that still has um, implications um, for the way in which you'd structure a trade, because it's there as a risk, or almost there by definition. So where the problems or the concerns um, about the um, operation of the market came in actually was when the Commission started to get in, involved directly. When the market itself was um, uh, left to extreme stress, again, I think it performed um, as well as you could hope any market that isn't perhaps the most developed of markets, wasn't always the most the deepest of markets. That's um, really quite a good result in terms of um, of pure market uh, structure. Did it generate some incredibly high prices? Yes, of, of it course worked. it did. But, but again, yeah. that wasn't because of the market. That was because of the market conditions. The HC Insider podcast is brought to you by HC Group, a retained search, intelligence and advisory firm focused solely on the global energy and commodity sector. With six locations across Asia, Europe and the Americas and over 50 consultants. To find out more, go to our website, hcgroup.global. There, you can also sign up for our HC Insider content for more interviews and white papers on relevant trends and talent impacts in the commodities world. One does wonder, though, right? So a couple of comments there, and I said, as we start to sort of pivot towards looking toward the next year. Earlier in the year, obviously, the, a number of the trading houses reach out to the European Central Bank, highlighting what could be a systemic risk. We had Craig Perong on an episode in the summer, a University of Houston professor who's been on a couple of times, who's, who's very strident and uh, clear-headed, I think, on some of this stuff, talking about where systemic risk exists. And we're now starting to get government intervention. Maybe you can comment on the, the proposed rules from the EU on the price caps you know, that they are considering. One does wonder whether this is this is you know we will look back on this year and and actually the slow moving of of government regulation is going to start to turn its Sauron's eye onto the the European energy markets and how they do trade and and whether actually irrespective of it there not being a systemic event it got enough people worried that there might be more regulation coming down ironically to manage risks or putting things onto exchanges. <laughs> You know, uh, in the wake of obviously uh, um, the financial crisis, etc. Anyway, I'm, I'm rambling. Do you see going forwards more government intervention? What is the EU doing on those price caps? What will the effect be of that? And do you think we might see a more regulated market in the future? I think that the danger is that we we might see a more regulated market because you know governments tend to you know let's strip it back. I mean, why are governments concerned about these markets? They're concerned because the price was high. You know, there is no logical flow that goes from saying, look, the price was high, therefore I must reform the market, that um, if I had um, regulated the market, it would generate um, lower prices in, 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 a, in a way that was beneficial to, to the economy. And that's the sort of the false thinking. And in case here, you know, I, I, I'm a I, I'm an economist by heart, so anything which moves away from the pure market signal for me is um, is bad. That generates um, the wrong result, the wrong signals. And I think there's a danger here that um, you know, rather than getting to the heart of the problem, the heart of the problem is right. Need more storage, um, need more terminals, need to get the internal gas market um, inside um, Europe working better. You know, need to reform through on, on the various um, wholesale uh, stages of uh, physical gas m moving on towards consumers. Rather than doing those things and um, reducing the frictions and putting in infrastructure so that um, LNG landed in Spain can move more easily through the system, it's always much easier to blame the market and um, say, right, our approach to um, the way we're going to get rid of high prices is just to tell the market that it can't go beyond a certain level. I mean, it, for me, it's very, very easy. It's much cheaper. But that's, again, going back into the old um, 
problem of not thinking about energy properly, not um, giving it um, a high enough position on, on your policy agenda and believing that um, a price cap, for instance, could be the solution. Now, I can't think of a single market where if a price cap has been operative, where the outcome has been a good one. Mm. Even if you put in too high a price cap, or too high in the sense that it wouldn't have been uh, kicked in, as I said, you do get um, unintended consequences. So you do get markets um, responding to that. Um, stuff will perversely move away from the exchanges and go over the counter. So it, it seems a bad development, but it's a very easy policy development for governments to say, look, we fix the problem. Yeah, and you get the, you know, yeah, you, you, we all need to crack out our Friedrich Hayek's and, uh, you know, understand that, you know, yeah, the minute you start messing around with prices and controlled economies and planned economies and so forth is the minute you get these distortions and a whole, the road to serfdom, I recommend people read it if they haven't already. You know, we do live in a world where there are price caps, there are windfall taxes as well, but you've got a, you know, a lot of government intervention is going on in the energy markets. None of them have yet really been impactful because we've yet to see really, as I said, the cold winter bite in Europe and, and the supply be tested. Where do you think, as you, know, you look towards 2023, what is going to be the result of, of these various initiatives? Yeah, I mean, I, I I should stress that I certainly wouldn't advocate going the full high echo. I mean, it's um, you know there is a role for governments here, but the, where governments um, the the role is, I think, in energy markets is is much more about um, issues of distribution and issues of of infrastructure. So you know, a, a price cap at other points in the um, in in the chain that's uh, aimed to protect consumers, so putting caps on on retail prices, for instance. I mean, that's a matter for governments. That's to do with income distribution. It's the distribution between the consumers and the companies, uh, and between um, sort of price regulation of the of the final consumer price and um, uh, taxation on the companies. You know, there, there's various levers in there in which they can play between. You know, it's, it's sort of the, the economic consequences and the income distribution consequences. So governments always have been involved in that and I think will continue to be. I, I think where I'm speaking out against is taking it down to the sort of the primary commodity markets, um, the original wholesale markets, the the markets with a price setting function. Those are very dangerous to regulate because um, you can't um, really achieve your income distribution and your balance between consumers and, and companies' goals through from a primary futures um, market in gas. Those are things to be done as governments wish to really at a later stage. But um, if you you need to know which price signal you should be reacting to. You need to know how much your choices on uh, on distribution and on the economy are actually valued at. And for that, you need to have a genuine undistorted wholesale price to look at. I mean, otherwise, you know, we're, we're, you're, you're back to sort of guessing what the price should be or what you'd like it to be. And that will be sending out the, um, the wrong signals and the wrong costings uh, yourself. So it's certainly going to be that governments um, will continue to be involved in terms of the regulation of the consumer markets and um, in all areas of the fiscal industry. It's really again, going back on to these um, benchmark uh, price uh, setting markets, those are the things where really governments uh, shouldn't be doing anything other than ensuring that those markets um, work well and are sending a good signal. And capping prices is not a way of ensuring that a good signal is sent. Yeah, it's also on the, on sort of the, the corollary to that as well is that we've had Gerard Reed on of, of Redefining Energy in their excellent podcast a couple of times. One of the we haven't touched on energy transition this you know in this look back because obviously there's been other bigger events but obviously that's been a a backdrop context to a lot of what's going on a lot of what he talks about is if we can get in particularly in in natural gas and power markets a much closer demand response to the wholesale prices at the consumer level that would have a big impact. And we've seen that, right? I mean, that's ultimately somewhat the story of oil is you've seen demand destruction as the price went up. And you just don't really necessarily see that in, in power and gas where you've got a lot more state involvement at that retail level. 
Yes, and that's right to a point. But clearly, if in Europe, in gas is perhaps a, an extreme here. But if we'd had full and immediate pass through of um, of wholesale prices through to the final consumer, you know, then you do sort of start getting into the issues of energy poverty yeah. in in terms of um, the effects that's having on your most vulnerable parts of uh, of your population. And it again does become a sort of an income distribution and uh, an equity concerns. So but again, that's something that the government can do through redistribution policy and capping retail prices. And there is a price tag attached to it. But in, and in many cases, the government does have to do that and um, you want to have some price signal and i've said in european gas demand is down double digit uh, percentage points so you know there clearly has been enough pass through to get a very strong demand signal but you don't want to um to pass through a signal which is starting to cause um, you know genuine distress and energy poverty you know that's sort of where you'd start to mute that signal you you know, you don't want the economic response to be for people to freeze to death. Yeah, no, no. Is there anything, just to wrap that little section up, is there anything that any of the, anything in Europe or more broadly, that is actually going to impact the wholesale prices in terms of the various proposed caps, etc.? Is there anything that's really going to actually impact wholesale prices and therefore stop that, that true signalling? I think the price cap itself on TTF is a potential threat, and the, the the original proposed numbers are fairly high. But there are countries within inside the EU who would like to impose those in at a lower level. And of course, once you've got one in, then it, it's quite easy to then create a debate to keep bringing it down, or um, you know, it, it can easily be adjusted. So even having a very high price cap as something of a precedent. But I don't think the governments are necessarily exhausted all they can do in the subsidiary markets. Regulation of companies and uh, and how they're setting retail prices, it's clearly not perfect. There's clearly a lot that can be done in terms of smoothing out uh, some of the faults through that. And then that whole taxation debate for sort of fits in. But, you know, that's what governments are actually quite good at. It's what... Um, their voters are responding to directly and you know, it's probably better for them to be concentrating on that than trying to get through the mechanics of the of the TTF um, uh, futures market but I agree with the thrust of your question that um, there probably is more intervention or interest if not direct regulation coming down the line in terms of um, government oversight of some of these markets. Yeah, which, you know, poses a real challenge and a risk, right? And uh, and clearly a trend is, uh, you know, whereas, well, the commodity sector is having to pay more attention to government regulation, government action, etc., and, and build up their governmental relationship teams to respond. But, okay, so, so zooming back out and moving over back to oil, looking at 2023, I would never ask you <laughs> what you think the price is going to be, but can you just give us, I guess, your sense of the, what you think might be in store for the markets next year and kind of the big things, I guess, to look, we should all be looking out for to, to know whether, signaling whether it's going to go one way or the other. Yeah, well, actually, we, we, we do have a price forecast, so I, I, you can, I, I'll, I'll give you that for free. Um, you know, we we forecasting um, Brent crude oil to average uh, $91 uh, in 2023. We instituted that forecast, um, well, back in June, and have sort of stuck with it since, and, uh, and still feel that's, that's pretty much, um, you know, wh- where prices should be on, on average through 2023. What's driving that, I, I think it's a sort of, the, in some ways, a continuation of some of the themes of this year. The first uh, and most important, again, is is demand. You know, to what extent the slowdown of economies will impact on uh, OECD demand? To what extent and with what speed uh, China can move out of its uh, COVID restrictions? And at what point will Chinese demand start to rebound. But as it stands at the moment, we're fairly bearish on demand. We, we think uh, all demand will average just 1.03 million barrels a day higher next year than this year, which isn't great. 
I think this might be a little bit of upside from that, but uh, not a huge amount of upside. So I think if we compare that with a year ago when we certainly were looking towards consensus figures of 3 million, 4 million, in many cases, uh, the extremes are much higher numbers. You know, the current consensus is a more between sort of 1 million and 2 million, and we're just at sort of the lower range of that. But key questions uh, on the demand side, very much um, to what extent the uh, recessions are, are going to be shallow, how long they will last, to what extent some of the um, demand losses last year don't come back, and returning a little bit to those transition issues which you've already spoken about. And they, they're they there, they're part of this kind of energy trilemma of um, dealing with it, with security and sustainability and, uh, and economies um, and energy's role between them. But um, clearly there are some transition issues on the demand side as well. So those are key on, on the demand side. On the supply side, no surprise here. Number one issue is Russia again. The extent to which um, Russian supply will fall in, in 2023. Again, our, our forecasts embed uh, an annual average fall of in Russian supply of about 1.4 million barrels a day. That's not a fall from current levels to its low. That's that's purely on, on the annual averages. Remember, Russia started 2022 at a very high level, but uh, 1.4 would be enough to sort of keep the market reasonably balanced uh, through Q1 and, and Q2. Uh, shouldn't be posing too much of a threat in terms of um, creating too much price upside, but it's a key variable. Should Russian supply fall by less than that, then the numbers start looking considerably soggier and implying that OPEC will have a little bit of work to do in order to to keep the market balanced. And so important to uh, see when OPEC is uh, will need to cut or if it needs to cut through the first half of the year in order to keep um, markets uh, reasonably balanced. And then the last big, uh, I would say variable, but certainly point of interest for the markets on the supply side will be the, the recurrent story of U.S. shell and the recovery of U.S. Uh, demand, uh, U.S. supply overall. So the gradual move back from sort of the 12.3 million barrels a day of crude supply that um, we're at now, pushing back towards that all-time record of 13 million on the crude side. If not reaching it by the end of um, 2023, then certainly getting very close to it by the end of 2023. So I think those are the big themes. But uh, overall, in terms of price determination, it comes down, to, as it always does, to what to the balance look like and um, uh, what does OPEC policy look like? There's so much in there I want to ask. <laughs> I, I guess uh, just staying on the supply side, uh, we had Morton Kelstrup come in, chief, former chief commercial officer of Merce Drilling, in the summer talking about more broadly about the, the upstream oil industry. At $97 a barrel, $91 a barrel, sorry, roughly speaking, everyone's making money. But the upstream oil industry has been very much sort of focused on capital discipline. Are you starting to see them get back into exploration? And this is, has an energy transition backdrop to it. I mean, what are you seeing on that supply side? Is, are the independent oil companies mobilizing? Are they exploring? Do they Are they investing in production? I, I think it varies a lot. In, even with the, among the the US companies, there has been a striking difference this year between the uh, uh, the private companies and, and the public companies. The private companies have responded, um, you know, more directly to, to to higher prices. They have increased their their well completions. They have increased their their rig counts. It looks like a, a fairly normal sort of price response. The response from the public companies has been much slower, much more lagged. Certainly, the amount to which exploration has um, has, has increased is is considerably more muted. Part of that is to do with the planning procedures uh, with inside the, the public companies. They, it does tend to be a little bit more lagged. It does tend to be a little bit more arranged in advance. Part of it is due to sort of specific bottlenecks in specific areas, and there clearly has been cost inflation in, in various um, key parts. But generally, it does seem to have um, been a, a, a very uh, significant uh, public-private split, and if we're looking for public-private splits, you know why? 
it does come down to that sort of company strategy that uh, public companies are putting their shareholder first, which is a little unusual in terms of um, <laughs> uh, certainly within the shale industry, so yeah. sort of first uh, couple of iterations. They are being much more cautious about capital. They are paying off debt, which in, in the longer term is going to be a, obviously a good thing to do. But um, they're not in that sort of early uh, shale model where you know, for every dollar you earned, you use that to spend a dollar fifty on on exploration, and you used it to to, to sort of increase your debt and just uh, grow to maximise that that model has gone and it's probably a very good thing that it's gone because it wasn't a particularly stable model. So some of these is the um, uh, if you like the economics of maturity, it's sort of moving on to far more sustainable. But some of it uh, t- does also seem to have been a you know, concerns about how investors might see the oil industry generally, you know, I- including ESG concerns. Mm. So that's the interesting split, I think, to continue through from, from next year to will the public companies start catching up with the private companies in terms of their economic responses? Or is there, you know, is, is that much more of a sort of permanent feature that public companies would tend to grow a little slower than, or well, significantly slower than some of the private companies? Yeah. There's quite a lot of, I guess, I want to move on to what might make that sort of $90 dramatically break either way to the upside or to the downside. And there are things on the horizon, right? As, as we talk, the public response in China to continued lockdowns seems to be having an impact on China's policy, you know, and, and maybe moving towards one of vaccination and, and coping as opposed to containment. You've obviously got now as well, the savings rate came out yesterday here in the US at 2%, and you've got interest rates at the 7%, and that's having a dramatic impact on the economy because everyone's been you know, used to 0% and all of the ills that that has brought. What things do you think we should be looking out for that might be those big triggers to have a real impact on energy prices next year? Yeah, I, I, it's a big difference here now between, um, if you like, short-term price issues and longer-term price issues. And start with the, with the longer term. You know that there is still a problem there that the back end of the curve is lurking below seventy dollars a barrel. I, I don't think any of us believe that the long-term price of oil should be below 70 or that at 70 you can generate um, supply capacity that will be needed for demand five, six, seven years down the road. And so that sort of problem further down the um, the time curve is unresolved and, if anything, is 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 getting worse. This um, tendency for the projected... Um, demand path to sort of follow a kind of business as usual and just demand uh, it will, keeps on increasing through to at least 2030 while the supply side is is reflecting um, a, a, a lack of investment and seeing capacity falling away and we haven't really sort of sorted out um, precisely why supply and demand uh, are following different price paths if you like so you know I certainly see the back end of the curve as um, representing extremely good value it would certainly be positive on those back end prices. However, I don't think being positive on those longer term prices is a good reason for being positive at the very short end of the curve. And I think that was some of the problems from last year, why people were sort of dragged into the kind of super cycle uh, pricing, was essentially that saying, hey, look, here's a theory about the long term and I think you should be using that to put a position on in the very very short term and that's where it breaks down I mean they are different things the short term is determined by the need for markets uh, to, to clear or at least price their own inventory changes and that's down to uh, factors which are much more short term and so in the short term for the, the coming year it's the same sort of thing as you've already mentioned China. I think those perceptions of the speed of liberalization on COVID measures in China and the likely potential increases in demand that might come from that, that's going to be, that's been a key theme for several months. I think it will continue to be a key theme going forward. So far, 
it's become a, a little bit of a dog whistle in the sense that um, you know, there's a slight um, easing in, in, in a COVID uh, measure. The market gets terribly excited. Prices rally a lot, uh, perhaps um, a little too fast. And then there's a sort of disappointment as it becomes clearer that the broader opening up is, is much further down the line. So that kind of um, volatility on China perceptions I think, is going to be a key theme in terms of, of the short-term movements. But again, I can't get away from overall demand and the uh, depressing effect on, on demand as the Western economies um, uh, move into at least um, shallow recessions, because generally oil finds it very hard to rally during uh, economic recessions, except for where oil itself has caused the economic recession. Uh, and I think in this case here, this, these recessions haven't been caused by oil. Again, makes it very difficult for oil to sustainably move higher. 91 uh, forecast, would, that's a pretty good price for oil during a recession. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's a good price. I think it's, um, as, as time goes on, that might look to be a price that has you know, fairly considerable downside risk if the um, the fall in the in in some of the economies is is deeper or longer than we currently think yeah what has caused or what are the fundamental reasons for the expected coming recession i mean, I, th- I think we've run it through i mean part of it is um it is the knock on effects um you know through from coming out of the the, the pandemic the knock-on effects that came through onto the stresses, onto supply chains, putting in inflation in, in, into the system. So it, it's a general sort of um, uh, economic crisis. A lot of it has, has come through from just natural cycles. I mean, you could say at some point it, it is probably time to, in terms of that's what economies do. So some of it is just in the natural rhythms. But the rest of it, I, I think, has sort of come through from some of these difficulties of um, climbing out of the pandemic without putting in inflationary feedback loops into the economy. And you know, that's um, uh, roughly where we are. Individual economies have, um, you know, have, have individual effects on, on top of that. But um, uh, the overall uh, global cycle is towards... Um, a, a a more depressed outcome, let's put it that way, rather than certainly not a depression, but it's certainly a more depressed outcome. And China as well has fed into that. I mean, taking mm. China's um, growth out of uh, the global economy makes a big difference. I think some of the um, partial decoupling, at least in certain sectors, um, uh, between China's economy and um, the, the US and European economies, and that has economic consequences. I mean, that sort of move away from globalism was good for growth, it was good for keeping costs down. And as we move you know, away from that system, you know, there will be a transition where we have to sort of adjust through to those um, perhaps longer term changes. So for all sorts of re- reasons, but I wouldn't put oil as a very high part of that. Obviously, it hasn't mm. helped having oil prices elevated. But um, in a counterfactual universe where the oil price hadn't gone up, I think economies would still be um, pushing towards a shallow recession. Well, I guess in, in some sense we are, as interest rates have gone up, so much more money is now needed to service these massive debts that you know, at the, the country level and at the individual level people have built up over the last 10 years, right? I mean, China, yeah. China's in a pretty, pretty sticky situation. As you say, deglobalization is also going on, um, which is actually, you know, uh, as we've talked on this podcast, bullish for a number of commodities as well, at least for the, the trading commodity community. Where do you see volatility is the other key part of what at least the commodities sector exists to manage as it transforms commodities in in time and place and 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 form is it going to you know is next year going to be just another volatile year for the commodities world it, it, it's it's certainly not um can't be very dogmatic about it because of course the whole Point about the, the most extreme uh, events of volatility are precisely those um, unforeseen shocks. And again, back to Ukraine, where whether that was to what extent that was foreseeable or not, it was certainly um, a major shock. But I, I think if we look at overall volatility as it stands for, for 2023, 
everything everything comes again back to to OPEC to the extent to which um, OPEC uh, will attempt to stabilize the markets uh, to to what extent uh, OPEC can be successful in in establishing you know at least a very soft floor on prices um, so worrying about those downside risks um, I'm fairly confident OPEC has got um, the ability to be able to create that sort of soft floor they're not targeting a particular price but they'll certainly be wishing to stabilize the market and uh, make sure we don't get another ruinous down cycle so downside volatility i think reasonably well protected upside volatility you know, it's getting harder to come up with uh, the sort of extreme sustained upside uh, scenario i mean it really does require economic outperformance it requires um, market sentiment to be turned around. It requires the interest rate cycle to peak at a relatively low rate, uh, China COVID, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't feel quite as exposed to the upside as it might have done uh, uh, last year. So to that extent, you would think a priori volatility should be a little bit more muted through 2023 than it was in 2022. But I go back to again that big proviso as um, British Prime Minister Macmillan once said, you know, sort of events, dear boy, events, you know, the, mm. the, the things that we don't know, the things that uh, will come along and sweep that uh, aside. There are potential shocks um, with inside the oil market. Um, you know, I'm very concerned about Libya, whether the um, sort of the breakdown of the, as I should say, truce between the forces in Tripoli and the forces in Benghazi, you know, whether that will have implications making it harder for Libya to sustain its uh, current production level. Iran is always there as, as a wild card on, on both the upside and the downside. So that's those sources of um, volatility perhaps feel as if they're going to be more geopolitical than anything else. And some of them, those will come with inside the oil market and bigger source of volatility. Again, we keep sort of circling around to it, it is back again on onto Russia and precisely how Russia's energy relations with the rest of the world um, develop over the course of the next year. Is Russia going to continue to weaponize energy, in which case the next thing to weaponize is oil? Or will um, Russia back away from that sort of directly aggressive use of, um, of energy policy as part of its sort of overall war aims? Mm. Yeah, and this is the world of commodities. So there's always uh, lots of surprises, and it's, it is at the very centre of world geopolitics and geo events. And uh, you know, and uh, I guess there's nothing much left for us to do but to uh, to wish everyone a, a happy new year and uh, and thank everyone for their time. And for me specifically, to thank you for your time, Paul. It's been a, a fascinating discussion and uh, a, a good one to give us pause to think on uh, on on the coming new year. No, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show, please give us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. To find out more about HC Insider and HC Group, a search and advisory firm dedicated to the commodity markets, visit our website at www.hcgroup.global. There you can find out more about our services and our offices around the world. There you can also find more content from interviews to insight pieces to more podcasts focused on the commodity value chains. Thanks again for listening.